Victoria Burns, PhD, is a registered social worker, writer, and university professor. She has a BA, Psychology, University of New Brunswick, BSW, MSW, and PhD in social work, McGill University. Drawing on over a decade of social work practice and her own lived experiences with chronic illnesses and addiction, her research focuses broadly on the areas of home, homelessness, stigma, addiction, and recovery. Dr. Burns combines her research interests with her passion for storytelling and the arts, including documentary film to raise awareness and combat stigma for marginalized populations. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sober as Dope podcast. I'm your host, Pop Buchanan, and I am extremely excited to have what we call a Sober as Dope superhero on the podcast today. Today we have Dr. Victoria Burns, PhD, and she's here to share her expertise with us, to answer any questions that the Sober as Dope community may have, and to bless us with her knowledge. Doc, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a lot to cover, and I want to start off in a special place. I want to start off with you. And when I was doing research, I came across something that was really, that, that hit home for me. It was your connection to your great grandmother and your grandfather and how that really, that the, the point where they had to go into a long-term facility and how that affected you. Can you explain how your relationship with your grandparents fueled your career and your work and the homeless community? Wow, you really did your research. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were going down this road. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. So um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. And um, for the listeners, I'm sure there are many who have experienced that safety was a big thing for me. So not feeling safe growing up, kind of walking on eggshells. And um, every Saturday, my dad would take my older sister and I to my grandfather's house. And it was really the only time that we felt like we could be kids. And my sister and I, even when we talk about my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, we, like, I'm getting teary. I just oh. kind of talking about it because it's, it just, um, it, it's, it, it's sort of, um, you know, talk about kind of risk factors for addiction and resilience factors and having that uh, emotional connection and safety with a caregiver is so important. And the relationship I had with my grandfather, even though he died when I was 12, it's so precious to me. And he lived autonomously in his own home up until the end of his life. And, um, so he ended up, um, he, he had type 2 diabetes. So I have type 1 diabetes. So we kind of have that in common. Um, which, and type 2, he developed it later in life. And I have type 1, which is formerly known as juvenile diabetes. Um, so he had some complications related to his diabetes. And he was no longer able, able to live independently at home anymore. And he ended up moving in with my aunt. And his health deteriorated. Um, so rapidly just because he didn't have that he wasn't able to entertain us anymore he didn't have that sense of purpose and he was also a low-income senior he lived in uh, subsidized housing and um, just the community he was a part of and in, in the subsidized housing was was so important to him so I experienced that with him so I've all I've had a very special connection to older adults in general um, but also, I think that, that spurs from the relationship I had with my paternal grandfather. And also when I was in high school, my maternal great-grandmother ended up moving in with us. And she was just a firecracker. And um, <laughs> she, uh, her and I got along really well. And um, yeah, she ended up 
same thing, ended up declining. She needed 24 hour care by the end of it, but she was well into her nineties. So she transitioned into a long-term care facility and just went downhill so quickly after that. So um, this experience of place, sense of place, home, um, I've always been really intrigued by that belonging, what it means to feel in place. And that led to a career uh, first as a home care social worker with older adults. And um, I did that gig for about five years. And then I really had uh, an interest in policy and systems change. And I couldn't do that as a frontline worker. So I ended up kind of using my career in home care as a jumping off point for my master's in social work and then that eventually led into a PhD in social work and working really with the marginalized of the marginalized. So we're talking about people um, who are experiencing homelessness for the first time in later life actually was the population I was focusing on. So people who had lived in stable housing for most of their life, had quote unquote, you know, normal jobs, family life, and found themselves on the street for the first time at age 50 and over. Oh, can you, and well, first of all, thank you for sharing the personal nature of your relationship with your grandparents. And many of us could relate, so God bless you there. Um, Can you, do you see any underlining, like what, is the main cause of this late onset homelessness in the older population like with these first being first time homeless i'm thinking to myself well i go through life i expect that everything is going to be well put together i have my dreams my hopes and then i hit 50 i hit 55 60 and something goes wrong and i find myself homeless one that could be devastating um what do you, I know there's many factors, but what's the main theme that comes up? What brings this population to this point um, to where they find themselves in homelessness? Like, well, what are the factors? Well, what I found in, in my research, there, there are kind of a few, a few main themes. Um, intense social loss is, a, is, a, is definitely something that propels people into homelessness. So uh, for example, I, uh, during, in my PhD, I had one participant who, over the span of five months, had lost his wife to illness, his daughter, tragically, and his mother. And he had been sober for 30 years, and his mother was, you know, or sorry, his wife was really the one who took care of all the bills and all that kind of thing, and and cooking, and... and um, Actually, we see in the literature too that men tend to, you know, tend to decline quicker when they when they lose their spouse, and that's what we're seeing is that with these intense losses, he had just uh, retired actually from an accounting degree or an accounting position, and he was in it. He had just turned seventy, and within a year he was on the street. What? Wow. I know. So, you know, it was just one thing after the other. And then, of course, when you add the drinking into that, things spiral out of control really, really quickly. And then there was sort of another population who, what we call um, invisible homeless. So even though they had a roof over their head, what we're finding is that seniors, because, um, and it's the same in the States as well, uh, I'm in Canada, but their pen, their um, old age security, you know, hasn't uh, caught up with the cost of inflation. So they're getting, you know, a lump sum every month. But when you look at the cost of rent, you look at the cost of food, you know, especially now with, with Corona and everything, it's just like everything, you know, your grocery bill is just out of this world. Yes. Um, I've noticed it myself. Yes. Um, and you know, they're living hand to mouth as it is, plus there's medications, plus there's a bus pass. So they're living, you know, um, they're spending more than 50% of their income on rent. So they're, they're in a precarious housing situation as is. And, you know, another illness comes on or they miss, you know, there's some unexpected uh, thing that they have to pay for. And that's why break, you know, the straw that breaks, breaks the camel's back and they're, they're in a shelter. You know, so, and also that population, there's, 
substandard housing is a huge issue. So bed bugs, lack of heating, which is a huge issue in Canada. You know, we go 30 below Celsius in the, in the winter time. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's dangerous. So people are technically homeless based on can Canadian definitions of homelessness, which are not just the visible homeless that most people think about, which actually represent a very tiny percent of the population. So the person, the panhandling on the street, um, they're the tip of the iceberg. It's really a lot of seniors, especially women represent invisible homeless. And there is also domestic violence in senior populations. So they may be doubling up with an abusive partner just to make ends meet. Okay. Okay, so this is a reality that's just there, and it's right now. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. So you 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 found a way to uh, uh, is a theme home, um, which I love home for the homeless, right? Trying to bring home to this population who's displaced and marginalized due to whether it's addiction, social pressures, anxiety, mental health runs the gamut, right? So can you tell us how you try to bring some normalcy and healing back to this traumatic population? Right. So I am a researcher. I, I will just put that up front that I'm, I have a, you know, I, I worked as a clinician in my undergrad, but I'm not a frontline worker. So what I do, the work I do is put forth policy recommendations and practice implications, right? So um, I'm just kind of putting that up as a, yes, as a starting yes, point. Absolutely. Um, what the main findings um, or the, the, the things that I've written about the most are how can we move or shift from a punitive model and this okay. is the same with, you know, if we're looking at rehabilitation for addiction, right? Homelessness, it's like, let's treat people who are living in poverty as criminals. Yes. You know, I don't know if you've been in homeless shelters before, but literally it's, you know, line up outside, get a number. It's very dehumanizing. Correct. And yeah. we expect people to bounce back and, and find housing when becoming homeless is a trauma in itself. That's so right. how can we employ trauma informed care within our systems? And part of that is even the design, if you think about, so I'm very much, I, I'm very interested in physical spaces as well and how yes. they, you know, what messaging they give. So exactly like that lining up, you know, is there a way that can that we can do something that's more humane than that? Yeah. Um, is there a way, you know, privacy is a huge thing, you know, here we have people who have lived, you know, especially with seniors where, you know, there's a lot of violence in shelters and, and, um, you know, bullying, right? right? So is there a way to ensure that people have privacy, like giving people a private room, and some of the women's shelters have done better, they're small, smaller scale, but we're trying to kind of eradicate that large kind of warehouse of, you know, um, shelter model for people experiencing homelessness, because A, it doesn't work. So even if we go with more of a conservative cost saving tactic, you know, we can say this actually doesn't work to warehouse people experiencing homelessness who, who are sick, you know, suffer from addiction, mental illness, and are in need of, you know, of, of support and not punishment. Yes. You there? Yeah, I'm just putting my uh, data because uh, okay. I'm worried that my I think my um I, I didn't want to lose my connection here. Oh no! It's, you, look you, good. you froze. You froze. Oh oh oh! Okay, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> All okay. right. So finding home after homelessness, finding home after addiction. Um, you are you have a passion for storytelling and you incorporate that in your whole study and you have, you did a documentary, you know, documentary films to raise awareness and combat the stigma for marginalized populations. And another thing that I really like is that you stated that your main job as an academic was to provide the data and evidence to show the policymakers who hold the purse strings, 
you know, mm -hmm. why, you know, this is necessary beyond housing to have this care to, to, to put more emphasis on treating people more humane. So can you talk about the dichotomy between, you know, the policy makers, the educators and the actual people on the ground and your work in the film industry and how that all works together? Um, well, I think that there there is a disconnect between what's happening on the ground and policy and um, what we say in French, Monsieur et Madame tout le monde. So everybody, you know, Joe, Joe Blow, or I don't know what we say, but, um, you know, the reason, uh, well, there's several reasons, but I'd say the main reason um, I started using arts-based research methods is, uh, well, I just find that I enjoy creating, I enjoy visual um, imagery. I find, you know, that cliche, a picture is worth a thousand words, but um, the, the, the goal of the documentary was to reach policymakers and service providers and to provide a medium that's accessible to the general public as well, because as academics, you know, academics are doing wonderful work, but it's often in this academies language that isn't very accessible. And it's also journals are expensive to have memberships to. So you don't really have an opportunity unless you are connected to get the data. So what we ended up doing is a, is a short documentary highlighting the stories of older adults uh, who are experiencing homelessness, all different types of homelessness. And we got a lot of good feedback from it, actually, from policymakers who just weren't aware, like, to be able to put a face to the statistics. Yes. You know what I mean? You know, and and not for me to tell their story, but for them to tell their story in their own words. And these are folks who have not kind of had the spotlight you know, so to speak, especially, you know, having come from from shelter life, from living on the street, um, and then to be featured in a documentary, you know, and roll out the red carpet, it was really a beautiful thing to see and also the community between them. So um, basically, it was a tool to raise awareness about a largely invisible population. Um, and just to, um, and a conversation starter, I would say, and it did get quite a bit of traction. Great. And um, sorry, my dog is. Oh, no, it's all good. Hey, we love dogs. <laughs> all right. He's just yeah, rolling. He's, he's excited. Um, hey, how you doing? Enjoy the podcast. It's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see him? Yes, he's, he's awesome. Okay. Yeah, we love dogs <laughs> over here. He's so. excited about <laughs> about this documentary, obviously. Uh, I, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but I think it's really like the first step towards any sort of policy change is awareness. If people aren't aware of the problem, and this goes for any sort of change, right? Like yes. when we're talking about personal healing of recovery, when we're talking about, you know, um, say awareness is the first step. So how can we get a message through to people? And usually, you know, numbers are convincing, but numbers don't necessarily stick. You know, you can, yes. you can show kind of some impressive or startling statistics, but I think it's really through the stories that people hang on and think, wait a minute, that's not okay. Yes, That's correct. not okay for my city to, you know, be warehousing my grandmother and grandfather. Like this could happen to my own grandparents or Correct. parents. Correct. It brings it home. It brings it home it for everyone. It totally brings it home, yeah. And I love how, you know, placing the invisible on the map and exploring social exclusion among older homeless minority men. Um, so that's real. And, and I think the visual aspects brings a whole nother dimension to it. And I'm so happy that you're taking that approach, especially being in academia. I want to ask you a straightforward question that we, you know, I want to get it from your perspective. It's simple. What is stigma? 
All right, we hear it a lot. We hear this cliche, breaking the stigma, breaking the stigma. What does that really, <laughs> really mean? And how can, in 2020 right now, when, as far as addiction, mental health, and the homelessness? Well, if we look back historically, you know, the, biblically, the stigmata, right? The stigmata okay. was a, literally a mark. Yes. Um, and it was not seen as something negative necessarily, right? If you had the stigmata, you, was you, blessed. you, know, you were blessed, right? So, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that actually rings true. But although, you know, um, because with, uh, with recovery, right, it's through the wound that all of the, the light it's through the cracks that the, the light gets through, but it takes a while to get to that point, right? Right, yes. Um, so the stigma is a mark that sets you apart from the norm, and it's seen as, as something negative. This is, I'm talking about today. So, um, you know, the stigma, uh, you know, we live in a, if we think of alcohol, an alcoholic society where alcohol is largely celebrated. So if you have a problem with alcohol, you're not part of the majority. You're seen as someone who, you know, is on the margins. Yes. Correct. You're not kind of in the main lane. You're in the, <laughs> you know, you're kind of in the dirt here. Yeah. And, and no one really wants to go there because it's not as attractive as the shiny, you know, of, of where the mainstream is. Right. And stigma will differ depending on the culture that you're in as well. Right. Right. Because, you know, if you're, if you're in a, in a dry community or if you're in a, you know, part of a religion like Islam where alcohol is not, celebrated then there's going to be a different type of stigma correct absolutely yeah absolutely and and definitely be the soap is dope podcast is definitely about changing the perception of recovery and breaking the, the negative stigma associated with addiction by explaining to people that there's an allergy there there's there's a problem that there's an innate disease that we have that we're born with and we shouldn't feel bad about like in my case um being an artist being a young guy that's out there i was you know naturally drinking and partying i was in college i was doing everything part of the you know the whole scene and at the end of the day, I was the one stuck with this issue. Like I still need to drink because I feel so abnormal the next day. And it wasn't, it took almost 15 to 20 years to understand my relationship with dopamine and the neurotransmitters and my mental, how mental health played into it, how trauma played into it and bereavement and how all these things made me at risk for, um, you know, being an alcoholic who had a mental health component. So I want to talk about something called morbidity and called morbid addiction and the within the mental health community and the recovery community. Can you, we just did, we did a series on this and I think it's fascinating because most treatment centers, they either address one occur, uh, one underlining disorder and ignore the other, um, and I think the conversation needs to, we need to bring the conversation together. Mental health and addiction is right here. It's one and the same. So can you talk about comorbidity and your experience, especially with the homelessness and just marginalized and, or in general for the whole addiction community? Right. So that's a really interesting, interesting topic for sure. And, you know, when we think of homelessness, one of the one of the big issues is is that it, it is this what we call a wicked problem, right? It's so complex. Yet everyone's working in silos, right? Is it uh, a housing issue? Is it yes? It's always a housing issue, but it's not just a housing issue. It's a mental health issue as well. It's a physical health issue, especially when you have seniors. When we're talking about seniors, right? Who need foot care? Who can't walk? Who you know? Who can't get? up the stairs in a homeless shelter because, you know, they're not mobile and they don't allow walkers, all of this business. So um, my understanding and from the research I've done, um, I adhere a lot uh, to the work of Gabor Mate. I don't know if you've- Yeah, I said we just featured him on the podcast. He's excellent. Oh, okay. Sorry, he did. Yeah, yeah. He's amazing. But um, yeah, trauma, right? Trauma is the thread through all of this. Yes. You know, 
in my own personal and professional experience, I have yet to meet a person who has not experienced trauma to some extent. And, you know, he, he's definitely, he's, he's the guru of this, but we need to broaden our understanding of what trauma is, right? That right. there's covert trauma and overt trauma. Yes. Um, and, you know, the field is just bursting right now. And, I think that's really promising because I think that g- approaching the issue through a trauma informed lens is yes. going to open it up and move it like we were talking about before from a logic of control um, and punishment to a logic of care. Yes. And community. And that's the direction we need to go in. I love it. And um Dr. Gabor Mate, when we, we, we had, he was talking about pain and addiction. He said all addiction stems from pain, right? It's some form of pain. And then we process that as this trauma. And I, um, just like the gentleman, and this really made me think deeply that you spoke of in the beginning where he lost his wife, then he lost his daughter. We know that loss and bereavement leads to trauma and that trauma creates a change in the brain through neuroplasticity, right? So every time we experience a loss, we don't know which way it's gonna go. Some people, the way they process it or the way they don't process this trauma has an effect. So that brings me to my next question, which is very exciting, the armadillo. <laughs> when, you, oh. when, you, <laughs> when we hear the term, what, what comes to mind when you hear armadillo? Because I know you did a study on this, and I think it's fascinating, the metaphor of the armadillo and trauma. So could we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, let me clarify. This was not a study. Well, this was, if we want to call it a, you know, a... a <laughs> an autoethnography, we can call it that, but really okay. it, it is a publication I did uh, about uh, becoming and unbecoming this armadillo. And I am a, I'm a, a big fan of uh, EMDR. Yes. Uh, have you talked about EMDR already on the podcast? No, you talking about eye movement desensitization and reprocessing? Yeah, so exactly. It's... Um, it's an evidence-based trauma therapy um, and it, it really works at the, you know, at a somatic level and that's where we're shifting, right? We know that, as that, that saying our issues are in our tissues, okay, right? And that talk therapy can only take us so far. You know, it's not to say talk therapy is not effective, but when we're dealing with trauma, it's really at that nervous system level. And, the armadillo came to my mind because, um, you know, that idea of fight, flight, and freeze. So you have this cute little armadillo who has this armor on his shell and a soft, vulnerable belly. And when threatened, literally rolls himself up into a tight ball. And for myself, having um, survived uh, childhood trauma and shock traumas over the life course, that is sort of how my learned response in trauma was not to fight or flight, because when we're children, also, we don't have anywhere to go. And to fight our parents, you know, is something right. we're not necessarily going to do. Correct. Although my two sisters were definitely more in, in, in that lane. And I was the, the shutdown freeze. Uh, and that's what I did for my entire childhood. It was be the good girl, don't say anything, don't ruffle any feathers, be good. I repress and lo and behold, today at age 38, you know, I've got a handful of autoimmune diseases, you know, uh, type one diabetes, celiac, uh, I have PCOS. So chronic illnesses that um, I've acquired over the years and you know, also the addiction, which is, you know, what happens is, you know, we build up so much. Um, so, so there's so much repressed emotion in our body that we can't deal with that pain. Right, <laughs> right. right. It has to go somewhere. So we yeah. numb it. Correct, correct. Yeah. Um, 
In my personal case, I, I, and I could, this is a personal story I'll share real quick. About a year and a half ago, I got a really nasty letter from someone that was real dear to me. And I reached out to them and asked them a simple question. Um, and they interpreted it in a negative way. And I really loved this person. I revered them. And they wrote me this like dissertation on just straight carnage. And I was just, I was so heartbroken. And I remember at the time, that's the first time I really was triggered. I wanted to fight. I wanted to hit something. I wanted, and I just, and I was out of state visiting family. So I had to drive all the way back. And literally four weeks later, I developed a, a debilitating lower back injury where I just couldn't even stand up. And then it just happened out of nowhere. And then it took me some time and I traced it back to that letter and how angry I was and how heartbroken I was. And I had nowhere to put that energy. That's the first time in my life I had nowhere to put it. And I should have immediately went to therapy. I should have started meditating. I should have really worked it out. Um, and I just really held it in and I'm fine. I'm just now dealing with that. I'm just now, now it's a year and a half later and I'm still like, I'm finally able to really work with my back. I have to wear cushions behind my back all the time now. And I'm like, wow, one negative experience If that, if they could do that, how does that look through time for someone who doesn't know how to deal with their emotions and where to put this trauma? It could really tear someone down. So um, I have a question from someone in the sober as dope community that really did, has a hard time with mental health. And sometime they'll submit a question to ask a professional like yourself. So you mind if I read the question for you? Go ahead. All right. This is from Janelle. Janelle asks, what should I do when traumatic memories come to my mind and I try to force myself not to think about it, but they still keep returning and getting worse? What we resist persists is the first thing I would say. Okay. Again, that's when the armadillo mode, right? When, when we don't accept the emotion, we still hold on to it. And so what that looks like is rumination. What that looks like is what happened to you. Um, Bessel van der Kolk uh, wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Wow. And that's exactly what happens. So this is where trauma-informed therapies come in. So EMDR, what happens is you start with your everyday trigger. So this example of, okay, this thing happened, your email. It can be something, you know, it seems innocuous, but for a person who's traumatized, it has nothing to do with the specific event. It feels like you're going to die when you get that email and you know, in your inbox and you think, but when, when it's hysterical and I use that word, you know, with its true meaning, you know, when it's hysterical, it's historical. And there's so much history tied into it that needs to be worked through. So when you're working with a skilled clinician, with a trauma therapy, a somatic based trauma therapy, you start with that trigger, but you trace back when was the first time you felt that emotion. And for lots of folks who experience trauma because you've been shut off from your emotions, this is my experience, it was so hard to even label an emotion right. because it was just kind of, you just sort of felt. Um, it's dissociative as well, like so disconnected from your body. So that's part of the healing as well as reconnecting and saying, where do I feel this? Okay, this is anger. And for a lot of people, um, you know, who were quote unquote, the quintessential good girls, feeling anger was not seen as acceptable, right? So, right. you know, so you first recognize that and no emotion is bad. It, that's also an unlearning. It's like all emotions are welcome. And as Gabor Mate would say, we welcome them with compassion. Mm -hmm. And rather than judging them and saying, oh, there's that, I shouldn't feel this, I shouldn't, I shouldn't react this way. Oh my God, I'm such a drama queen. Oh my, all the labels. You have to do away with those and you have to say, okay, I'm feeling anger. And then you trace that back. Okay, when was the first time? Because, and then you go back to those memories and you don't have to get invested in the whole 
icky narrative of it, but it's to work through them um, and then to get your system to regulate itself on its own. And then you start to build trust with your body because like what happened with you, right? You went into fight mode and then you went into shutdown mode and you were holding on to all your cortisol was up right and you're Correct. holding on to all these stress hormones that start to eat away at your at things and they find a place and then you know so with in order to allow the to allow the emotion to pass through you and be curious about it and be compassion compassionate about yourself that's the way and then over time like this is a practice right it's not like a one shot yeah. you know no. like Nope. kind of thing and that's where people I think have a hard time with these trauma therapies because we think like oh my god I should and it's like should has to be out you know not part of your your vocabulary anymore Correct. like stop shooting on yourself because yeah. that's not helpful it adds pressure it adds exactly pressure. it's really about you know allowing all these emotions um to to come through and to pass through and to learn to regulate your to regulate your nervous system again. Right. And and I, and one of the main themes that we talk about on the Sober as Though podcast is deactivating the parasympathetic response, that fight or flight response with um, mindful breathing and mindfulness, meditation, um, taking time out every day to bring yourself back to a focal point, having a gratitude journal and things like that helps because this is an ongoing thing and we have to watch the triggers. In order to maintain recovery, you have to be mindful of potential triggers and you have to have an action plan and tools in place for when, you know, a trigger arises and how to evade that and to watch out for the stress. So I love that. When I was looking into MD, uh, M- EMDR, um, and that was uh, invented by Francine Shapiro as a form of psychotherapy. And so what, the, what you guys do is you record the stressing images that they're, and the, the therapist directs the patient in bilateral stimulation. You want to talk about the bilateral stimulation and how that works? Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a clinician. The, the, I, granted, definitely. I, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insinuate that, but I know you could probably speak on this as an effective form of therapy. I, well, from my own personal experience, because it has yeah. helped me, it has done wonders for me. Yeah. I've been, you know, in therapy for over 20 years. Um, it, honestly, when I first started, it felt a little bit woo-woo, because <laughs> I think you're using your body. And for someone who is extremely um, cerebral, it just was like, this doesn't make sense. What do you, right. you know, so you kind of have to let that go. Let all of those, uh, you know, judgments, uh, and have an open mind. So basically, there's different techniques. I've done a couple different ones that I can share. Um, so there's these pulsers, which when I was actually doing it in person, because pre Corona, we, we used to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, And I would literally hold on. So when, once we would identify what the trigger was, so something, something that had come up through the week um, where I got activated. um, So then we would, she would, my, my psychologist would prompt me through um, to focus in on the sensations. And when a difficult part would come up. So when I would get more activated, I would focus. So it's literally these pulsers you hold in your hand that pulse bilaterally. And there's something about that mechanism that rewires the brain, essentially, it opens up different pathways. So, you know, say there's something when you go, um, it kind of basically creates more space or capacity in your brain to handle situations in a different way and not get so, um, you know, get into a trauma response where you shut down and get really tight and everything feels like death. So literally that's what it feels like. So it basically creates more space by, by going through um, what the memories were, what the experience was, what it felt like connecting it to the body. 
and focusing on this bilateral movement and it's called eye movement reprocessing desensitization. So it actually reprocesses the memory and you can imagine it like, I think of like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory, like coming out the other end, you know, a candy in a different way, right? Putting something right. in and then this beautiful candy coming out of this machine. And it kind of does that, you know, so, but it's very subtle, I would say. So, you know, for example, you know, a tr say a trigger is, you know, you write an email to a friend and, you know, and, um, you know, you don't get a reaction back or something like it's right. sort of like ghosting. And then you start thinking about that and you're like, oh my God, like, you know, you go into first maybe resentment and then it's shame and then it's screw you and Correct. all this. And so then, um, but that's often because of a childhood memory uh, or something that happened where, you know, there's that core belief of I'm not good enough. No one loves me. You know, someone's not responding to me. It's, you know, they're rejecting me. Yeah. Right. Correct. So by working through and kind of coming up with uh, working through those emotions at a somatic level and being a, you're reprocessing it. So you can use the pulsers, but you can also use what we do now because, of COVID is I, there's, um, if you Google on YouTube, uh, EMDR, uh, uh, I think it's EMDR processing or something like that. And there's a little light, <laughs> basically, you just watch this little ball go back and forth on the screen, a little green light and, and you follow that. And then she would probably, okay, Victoria, process this. Okay. We're going to do processing on this. And then we, and then I watch literally, um, you know, this bilateral movement on the screen, and then we keep doing this. And, the, and it's, it, it, you know, it's not a, like I said, it's not a quick and dirty therapy, which in our society, that's kind of what people like, right? And that's what often right. EAP will pay for is five sessions. And you're like, how am I going to unlearn 30 plus years of trauma and bereavement and, and negative you know, fixed core beliefs about myself in five sessions, right? And That's the system's right. just not set up for it. It's not, it's not. And in my case, I had to, when I first, so I'm seven years sober. And luckily when I went to rehab, they took, a, uh, they took two approaches. I had to see a therapist, I had to see a psychiatrist. They did my psychosocial, I, they put me on Wellbutrin. And I, that was all while I was dealing with the addiction and I was going to, re, I was in rehab and I was doing all of the work, but I tell people it's usually like a minimum of a year before you even, you know, you get into this groove. And I try to encourage that. So we're friends of therapy on the Sober's Dope podcast. So thank you for, um, from a doctor perspective, you have um, just saying that helps a, a bunch of people because that's a stigma in itself, therapy. People, oh, that's not for me. That's for them. That's, that's still that stigma, right? And the person could be struggling and really need it and never really get to that point. So I'm really excited. So right now, are you working on any new documentaries any new films anything interesting going on <laughs> um i've actually been doing a lot of a lot of writing lately and um yeah i'm just i'm very interested in the relationship between trauma addiction and chronic illness that's something just from my own lived experience and it seems yes. like that is the direction we need to go in and um, there is one project uh, I've been sitting on some data right now on addiction stigma in the workplace. Oh. So okay. um, this is uh, we received a, a, a pretty small grant, so we wouldn't be able to really do much. It was more of a pilot study, but essentially what we are interested in knowing is um people's experiences with addiction stigma on university campuses. So from my experience as a person in recovery, long-term recovery as well. So you and I are almost the same age. Yes, correct, correct. <laughs> almost. You're, almost. Much young, you're much younger than me. <laughs> oh, yeah, every day counts. No. Yeah. <laughs> or whoever woke up the earliest is the most sober, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, <laughs> so, um, but from my experience as a social worker and um, so someone who, who has a history of working in healthcare and then academia, um, 
there was so much stigma and shame around, around, um, you know, seeking help for addiction, even though we know that one in 10 people suffer from addiction, uh, and, um, more so in, in the healthcare field because of high stress, high and, stress. but there's this added stigma. And so we've got the double stigma of addiction as well. Substance, uh, substance use disorder, as they call it, and, uh, compared to mental health, even what we're seeing. So there is some literature on mental health, kind of how, you know, there's been a lot of campaigns in Canada. We have this bell, let's talk, you know, the, the, so people have, and that's changed the conversation. It seems like people are more comfortable even at work saying, you know, like I suffering from depression or anxiety, but saying, you know, you're an alcoholic or especially if you're a doctor or a nurse or, you know, it's, right. um, you know, the stakes are much higher because there's the whole issue of fit for practice. So anyway, all this to say that, um, you know, it kept me sick for a very long time, not being able to get the help that I needed. And I know from meeting other professionals in recovery that who are, you know, still, quote unquote, in the closet, that it's doing a disservice, I think, to their communities as well, because it's seen as something, you know, all those old stereotypes that aren't true, um, you know, being a loose cannon, being, a, you know, oh, my God, like, you know, the whole moralistic arguments obviously if people are you know if we if we saw it for for what it was um that these are people you know in pain traumatized yeah. people often you know it would be a different conversation so um we interviewed all of the deans of the university and staff people working for you know in staff wellness and human resources just to get a lay of the land of their experience uh, with people going on medical leave or people reaching out saying, look, like, you know, I'm struggling. I need some time off. And there has been, there was literally one person like, and these are people who have histories of working, you know, in academia, like decades um, mental health. Yes. Physical health, of course, you know, people going, needing chemo treatment, people, with diabetes, but um, not with addiction, you know, and as a person with type one diabetes, people know, um, I'm actually on medical leave uh, for my diabetes, uh, because, you know, it's, it's a real thing, you know, and people go on medical leave all the time for physical illnesses, right? And there's, right. people aren't ashamed. Imagine if every you know, cancer survivor was ashamed to share with other people experiencing cancer that there is a, you can recover. <laughs> and that's, that's right. kind of how I see it, right? It just doesn't make sense. So what we're trying to do is, um, you know, put it on the map. Okay, addiction stigma in higher education is, a, and I think university and college campuses are, are unique as well because, you know, binge drinking is celebrated, yes. but there's people who, can't drink in safety. So how do we help those folks? Right. And again, that awareness piece, and maybe a documentary will come out of this eventually, I think. Um, but it's really hard to, um, because of the stigma, again, to interview people, you know, professionals, like who are in recovery. And I think that's a big issue. And you think even there's, um, you know, special AA meetings for doctors and lawyers because they can't mix amongst the, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. No, li liability issues there. It's liability yeah. issues. Or, or perceived liability issues, right? Exactly. And, and, and if you, in the States, it's different than here, but, you know, you're basically, if you're in it, if you have addiction, a history of addiction, you have to get tested, you know, every month or, you know, you basically are, you know, have a, a babysitter checking up on you and it's very it's, it's very controlled right just right. to make sure you don't realize and there are definitely risks I'm not saying you know that there are definitely real risks there but you know is the approach again that punitive or is it coming from from a place of trauma-informed care and I I think we're still more in the uh you know people who are addicts need to be there's something wrong with them um you know there's something bad like about that rather than saying wow here's a person 
yeah, who has a genetic predisposition, who has this history of trauma that set it off, you know, like, right. can we be compassionate and help people rather than keep them in the closet? And that was what my experience was, is this, when I ended up getting my first full-time position saying, don't tell, I had senior professors saying, you know, because I was doing research in the area of homelessness. So we know research and, you know, or homelessness and addiction are, are you know, or there's so much overlap. And I felt like I couldn't quite get into my, share my research in an honest, in an intellectually and emotionally honest way, because I was, you know, it'd be like you trying to do this podcast and not telling anyone you were in recovery yourself. That's right. It would be hard. (laughs) It would be difficult. (laughs) Right? Like you always feel like you're you're living like a half life or something. So anyway, I ended up, you know, now I'm, I'm, you know, as I say, out of the closet because I'm in a position of privilege as well. Like, and I think with great privilege comes great responsibility. You know, I have, you know, not when you're living on the street, you don't have the privilege of deciding to keep your use secret or not. Right. 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 And so I think that we need to have people such as yourself who are spreading the word, you know, that this isn't something to be ashamed of, you know, and I think it's like little by little, the, the pendulum is swinging more into that openness and, and seeing it as, you know, opportunity and even celebration, you know, that that's right. drugs are, and alcohol are not, you know, basically just have more of a balanced view about, you know, what the consequences are as well of, Correct. of uh, drug and alcohol use, right? That it's not a benign substance. That's right. And, um, and yeah, so that's like so important. And that's the whole mission because I always shed light on the same people that's judging most likely are closer to the functional alcoholic side. And no one ever wants to talk about the functional alcoholic and, and that reality, you're one drink away or one, one day away from just being, uh, alcohol, uh, you know, struggling with alcohol. So I have a, I had did a, a cool episode called from functional to alcoholic, right? Because people always try to separate the two and the alcoholic is the alcoholic. It's like trying to separate like low grade depression and high functioning depression and trying to say they're both two, like, it's just, they're not, it's different, but it's both, it's some form of depression. It's on a spectrum of depression is still a mental health issue there. So my thing with people is I had to make that decision with my family. And, you know, I remember one of my members of my family pulling me aside one day and saying, you know, Joseph, you don't have to um, talk about your addiction. Right. Cause we was at a family gathering. It was a lot of people around. It was a doctor who came up to me um, and he saw me with an AA book came to believe one of my favorite books and this doctor like literally lost it, pulled me aside and said, hey, like we, it was like this thing of ours. And he said, you're an AA. I said, yeah, I'm just, this is like my first, this is year one of my recovery. And he said, man, this is awesome. And he was talking to me. One of, he was a friend of one of my family members and my family member was a little embarrassed because he was saying like, you know, Joseph, you don't really have to. And I said, well, how, how would it be? Uh, how, how, I I need to. I have to tell my story. I can't. Sh- I can't keep this hidden because something saved my life. I, I I'm a, a walking miracle. I'm here, and this problem was deep on so many levels. It was the physical level. It was the emotional level. The psychological level. The spiritual level. I I felt like I was trapped on so many levels that. If I experience that, then there's millions of people who's experiencing that darkness. And there's no way because with great privilege comes great responsibility. And privilege is not always about race. Privilege is about your ability to have knowledge, education, and being on the end, right? And I I went through the fire. So I was privileged to have survived. So I had to share it. So that's why I said no. No. And then I did a, then I started a podcast about failures. I, oh my God. And then I had to take into account my profession. Like I, I, I'm a real, real estate investor. I had, I, you know, I'm a college graduate. I, I work with a lot of different functions. My, my family, my, one of my brothers is a Catholic priest. So it's the whole connection with that. And it's a lot of exposure. And then I had to say, well, what's my professional risk? And I'm like, there is no professional risk really because I'm in recovery. 
that means that I'm operating at the highest level of society now. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I barely party. I'm good. I Hey, I'm a pillar of health, right? So I could go out there and share the story. But most people don't want to take that leap of faith, right? So that's where the anonymous movement is coming from. And I think the more we, you know, the sober curious movement is doing a great job at helping people start to realize that, hey, there's a lot of benefits in recovery and it's kind of cool. And I think that with recovery, we can help with the mental health. And then once we start to get that under control, we can fix our our internal health, get a lot of these chronic illnesses down. Um, I reversed pre-diabetes in my recovery, right? So one of the things when I got sober, I started eating crazy and and then when the doctor told me I was pre-diabetic, I lost it. I said, you know what? No, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be the, the black kid with the diabetes. I'm not doing it, right? <laughs> so I changed my diet. I started educating myself on the plant-based diet. I went a little keto to plant-based, reversed my pre-diabetes in three months, right? Got my blood up, my blood, my, my, um, my AC1 down and my, my blood sugar glucose levels down. And that's what started the whole Monk Healing page that you found me on. Monk Healing was about me talking about how I, I, I was a recovering alcoholic who was able to reverse his pre-diabetes. And now I want to share my story with other people. So doc, you're right on the front line. Your work is, um, so important. We barely scratched the surface on all of the accomplishments and the the academia and all your contributions to the industry. So I would love to have you back on. Um, before I go, any closing remarks and, and uh, any message that you could give to anyone out there that's suffering from addiction right now into the recovery community? What would you like to say in closing? And can you let everyone know where they can find you online? Well, first, I just want to say I, I really love what you what you said and just your your journey of coming out as, you know, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> because it's not easy. And I think that that's part of my message for folks is that the risks are real, you know, and this is because of the stigma again and the consequences are also real. So, you know, it's for me, it wasn't a overnight, okay, flip the switch. You know, I'm a, I'm a grateful person in recovery, doing the recovery dance. Right. You know, it's been a process. It's been a really difficult process. And I think it ultimately, the, the word that comes to mind with recovery is freedom. And when you're in recovery and you're still leading that double life of sneaking around, uh, going to sneak into meetings. Oh, did, does this person know? Did I tell this person or is this person not in the person who knows group? It, it's that cognitive dissonance again, right? Where you're right. holding these two disparate beliefs and that creates tension and recovery. The beauty of recovery is being true to yourself, being, integrated yes. and being free and that is the biggest gift so anyone suffering out there you know it is possible and there's there is a movement of you know different different approaches there's no one size fits all it's figuring that out that's the beauty of it um so yeah you're just definitely not alone and if you have any further questions or comments, you can reach me on my Instagram account. It's the handle is at Beaties, as in diabetes, Beaties and Bites, B-I-T-E-S. And we didn't like get to that. talk much about food, but that's another passion. Oh, we'll my- get into that. <laughs> Mine's too. Well, maybe we'll have, <laughs> we'll talk about that on our next episode. And, and Doc, Doc, if you don't mind, we would love you to be uh, one of our resident um, docs who could come on and give us your knowledge and help us work through some of the, the recondite studies and stuff that's out there and kind of digest a lot of that to us. It would be an honor. And, 
it, today's a really big and important day for me, meeting you and having you on. It's a highlight of the Sober is Dope podcast. It's an achievement for us because to get to this level, to speak to someone as brilliant as you and as accomplished means that we our message is on, uh, streamlined and we're on the right track. So thank you for giving us the, your time and your energy. And I wish you well on your process uh, with your trauma and um, and we can, we'll heal. We're all healing and we're going to get there together. We're still young, right? And we could get through all of this and get to the other side and be whole and redeemed. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. I'll catch you on the other side. Have a good day. Thanks, Doc. You too.